Good morning once again. The Lord be with you. Thank you so much. This morning our gospel lesson comes to us from the gospel according to St. Mark chapter 1. And we will read and hear together verses 14 through 20. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you can find this on New Testament page 33. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. And here's what it says. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning I would like to begin by sharing a poem written by James Patrick Kinney. I actually posted it on Facebook a few days ago. You may have seen it there. I'm not exactly sure how widely known it is. I would guess that some of you have heard it or read it before. It's called The Cold Within. And it goes like this. Six humans trapped by happenstance in dark and bitter cold. Each one possessed a stick of wood. Or so the story's told. Their dying fire in need of logs, the first woman held hers back, for on the faces around the fire, she noticed one was black. The next man looking across the way saw one not of his church and couldn't bring himself to give the fire his stick of birch. The third one sat in tattered clothes, gave his coat a hitch. Why should his log be put to use to warm the idle rich? The rich man just sat back and thought of the wealth he had in store and how to keep what he had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man's face bespoke revenge as the fire passed from his sight, for all he saw in his stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. And the last man of this forlorn group did not accept for gain, giving only to those who gave was how he played the game. The logs held tight in death's still hands was proof of human sin. They didn't die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. We've now reached the final installment of our 72 plus U sermon series, which hopefully has helped us to sense some of the ways that God moves through our lives that we might be more faithful disciples of Jesus. To recap, three Sundays ago, we thought about how God discovers us for service. And the week before last, we talked about how God equips us for service. And seven days ago, we discussed how being connected is integral to our service. And now here, in the fourth and final week, our focus is the notion that we, as Christ's disciples, are sent. 
And I have to say, I really, really wanted this sermon to begin with that well-known scene of Jesus calling out to the fishermen. That well-known scene where he says, follow me and I'll make you fish for people. Because it's obvious how that fits within this context of sending. They're called with the promise of being sent. Made a lot of sense to start that way. That would have been easier to write that sermon. (laughs) It would have been perhaps easier for all of us to hear that sermon. And I agonized over it as I thought about the text because I realized, much to my chagrin, that that isn't actually, that story, that image, that scene isn't actually how Jesus' sending begins. His first command isn't to follow. It isn't to fish. It isn't to give. It isn't even to love. The first recorded command of Jesus in the first recorded canonical gospel is to change. Most of our English translations have the word repent. Which literally means to be of a different mind. The first mandate that Jesus gives in the first recorded gospel is to change your mind, to be different, to think differently. Now, living differently follows suit. The loving and the giving and the forgiving. But the first mandate of Jesus is to change. The time is fulfilled, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. So repent and believe in the good news. The whole of Scripture is a continuous invitation to repentance, to turn away from those things that would keep us cold, those things that lead to our death and to the death of those around us. But it's also an invitation to believe in the good news. The news that God loves each of us. That God has a way for each of us and for all of creation. A way that leads to life. We know, or I hope we know anyway, based on what scripture reveals, that it isn't God's desire that anyone should perish. Be it those whom we love, those with whom we would have no problem sharing our firewood, or those whom we don't love. Those like the people in the poem whom we regard as less than us, and those whom we, for whatever reason, regard as our enemies or enemies of God. God doesn't desire that anyone should perish, but perish we will if we don't heed God. If we don't each day repent of those things which cause us to deny God's love to others and instead lay hold of that love of God, which tells us that God's kingdom is near and that God's power and that God's goodness aren't meant to fill only our hearts and our homes with good things. They are meant to fill the whole world with all of that which gives life. The time is fulfilled, Jesus says, as he begins his work among us. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom is near. Repent, change, and believe the good news. What is? What is this good news? Well, I think that it is that very news that's found on Jonah's lips. We heard a snippet of his story this morning. It's that news found upon Jonah's lips as actually an accusation against God. This accusation 
that God is gracious and compassionate even to those who don't deserve God's grace and compassion. I recommend that you take a few minutes later today and read the entire book of Jonah. The protagonist, as you may know, was a prophet of God who did not want to do what God wanted him to do. He did not want to go where he was sent. He didn't want to travel to that great and wicked city of Nineveh. He didn't want to go to that land that we now call Iraq, to that city that we now call Baghdad and proclaim to its citizens God's judgment upon them for their wickedness, the judgment that in 40 days from the time that he spoke their city and they themselves would be destroyed. And why didn't Jonah want to go? Why didn't he want to do it? Was it because that Jonah didn't want to see Nineveh, that city that had oppressed Judah and its neighbors for so many years destroyed? Was it because Jonah was afraid for his own life, afraid that the citizens of Nineveh would kill him? Did Jonah attempt to flee in the opposite direction and end up being swallowed by a great fish until he altered his attitude because he feared dying if he did what God had asked him to do? I mean, I don't know, but I really don't think so. In fact, the text shows us that Jonah didn't fear death in the least. It shows us that he was more than willing to sacrifice his own life to save the lives of others. Right? Because he attempted to save the lives of the people aboard that ship that he was on. You know that ship that he was on when he was trying to get as far away from God as possible? And to, me it, to me, it seems far more reasonable to say that, that Jonah didn't want to proclaim God's judgment upon the wickedness of Nineveh because as we are told later in Jonah's story, he knew He knew from the very beginning that God is a gracious God. Gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. And knowing this, knowing this, Jonah feared that if he went and preached against Nineveh, as God wanted him to do, That something just might happen like that which did happen. That Nineveh would repent and God, instead of destroying them, would actually have mercy on them and save them. You see, Jonah believed that Nineveh deserved to be obliterated. Just like the people in our opening poem didn't care that those whom they despised might freeze to death. Even if it meant dying themselves, they were going to hold on to what they had because it was theirs. And they so hated, so despised those others with whom they were sitting that they were ready to die themselves because they weren't going to do a thing for those others. Jonah feared that maybe... Just maybe, even though God had declared that Nineveh was evil and that Nineveh was to be decimated, that God would end up being too compassionate, too loving, too forgiving. And so Jonah's tale ends 11 verses after the passage that was read today, and it concludes with a story. A story about how Jonah leaves Nineveh when he sees what's happening. And he goes away sulking. He pouts. Because he realizes that God cares for those that he thinks God shouldn't care about. He pouts. Because those who have done evil things and wicked things still receive mercy. 
And in this, I can't help but think about how hard it is at times. Even for those of us who believe in God and love God, who believe in God's love for us and for the world, it's very hard for us at times to accept how liberally that love is displayed, how hard it is at times to follow Christ wherever He may lead us, to go wherever He may send us, and to let Him make us fish for people. There is, it seems, something in us that doesn't want to cast wide the net of God's love or to haul in whatever fish might be caught in that net's embrace. There is, it seems, something in us that resists yielding all of our preconceptions and and all of our prejudices and all of our worldly attitudes and simply going out and doing what God asks us to do. Which is to share this good news with everyone. Not the ones whom we think are deserving. Not the ones whom we judge as worthy. We are sent to the world. The time has come, Jesus says, as his ministry commences. The kingdom of God is near. Repent again. Change your mind. And believe the good news. See, Christ, Christ invites everyone to newness. Irrespective of who they are. He invites everyone. From the truly And most obviously wicked to those like us here today. Those of us who might be more like Jonah than we care to think. Those of us who love God and believe in God's word, but we just can't bring ourselves to go to some of the places or to do some of the things that divine love calls us toward. Those of us who can't bring ourselves to welcome and accept some people, even when they are repentant. Those of us who can't bring ourselves to forgive others, even though they have asked. Those of us who can't bring ourselves to reach out to certain folks because of who they are or where they're from or what they believe, those of us who perhaps, perhaps can't even bring ourselves to believe that God finds us acceptable. That God loves even us. But we must recognize That repenting and believing in the good news, it's a day-to-day process. It's a day-to-day following. It's a day-to-day being sent. It's a day-to-day setting aside of those things that offend God. Those things that are contrary to God's will. And replacing them with those things that are approved and commanded by God. And so it isn't enough. It isn't enough to say once... To repent once, to say one time, I'm sorry and I believe, (laughs) it would be enough if we could actually do it. If we could actually live into it. But the sad truth is the spiritual life typically isn't that cut and dried. It typically isn't that easy. It typically doesn't work that way because sin... And the effects thereof keep dragging us down and we so easily slip back into ungodly ways if we aren't continually in the process of repenting and believing. If we aren't always in the process of following Jesus, of allowing ourselves to be sent by Jesus, of allowing Him to work in us and to make us the ones who, because we follow Him, do what we are sent to do. And that is to fish for people. And the reason we fish, 
The reason we fish is because God wants all of us to experience God's goodness. God wants all of creation to experience God's love. God wants all people to live, to come close to Christ and close to one another and to use those gifts. Those divinely bestowed gifts to help one another so that none of us need perish in the cold. As that poem said, the cold ultimately doesn't come from without, it comes from within. But thanks be to God, it can be replaced. It can be replaced with warmth from within. The warmth of God's love being accepted and set free to work in us and through us. Transformation takes effort just as fishing takes effort. But the good news of the kingdom is that God is with us as we are sent. That God is with us when we do the work. That God is with us to help us repent, to help us to be changed. God is with us to help us believe. God is with us to help us walk faithfully. And that God is with us and loves us even when we stumble and fall. And really all we have to do is to turn our hearts in our minds toward the one who wants us to receive life and to keep them there to the one who offers life and then to walk that path that God leads us on. You know, I wasn't there, but I have to believe that Jonah's life would have been so much easier if he had simply accepted that he was sent. When you read closely the gospel text for today, their response is pretty immediate, isn't it? Immediately they left their nets. Immediately they left their boats. Immediately they left their father. Immediately they left the hired hands. Immediately they followed. Jesus calls and away they go. I have to believe that Jonah's life would have been much easier if he would have just said, okay, I'm sent, so here I go. If he'd simply gone and done what he was told to do by God at the very first, if he would simply, if he would simply set aside his worry that God might actually prove to be kind, <laughs> that God might actually prove to be compassionate, and if he would have just proclaimed God's message as he was instructed. His life would have been so much easier if he would have just warmed his heart to the Ninevites and, and attempted to see them as God did. Our lives, too, can be a lot easier. Not easy, but easier if we would simply do what God asks of us. Because, dear ones, we are a sent people. We are a sent people. Discovered by God and equipped by God and connected to God and sent forth with a mission from God. We are a sent people and our God is a God who wants us to live and to love in such a way that the image of God in which we are made might thaw the cold within. May we therefore live and may we therefore love as Christ Jesus lives in love. Offering the good news of abundant life to all. And inviting them to follow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.